grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome today. We're looking at the topic, you can exalt him as he is. God is beyond description. God is beyond any mortal words, created things that we can use to eulogize him. We still praise him regardless. But no amount of praise, no amount of uh, words, exaltation will be commensurate to the immensity of his being. God is greater than any exaltation. God is infinitely above any magnification from any human vessel. Because whatever appreciation or praise that is coming from finite beings, it will still not be commensurate to the infinite being of God. But yet we still keep giving thanks to him. So who can exalt him as he is? Is it in terms of him as God? Can we exalt God enough as he is? Is it in terms of him being our father in the new creation? Is it in terms of his salvation? Is it in terms of his creation? The created, the, 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 the innumerable creatures, the sun, the moon, the stars, who can magnify him as he is? We go through the book of Psalms, we go through the scriptures, and we just start seeing different dimensions. Psalm 145, one of my favorites in these areas, talks about that the unsearchable greatness. Who can exalt his unsearchable greatness? What a joy. God's complacency is in himself alone. And so there are many things that make, innumerable things that makes God unique from every other human being, from every other creature. Because God is God in whom, which is Kadosh, the holiness of God. God being distinct from every other thing. God is only complacent, satisfied in himself alone. You are complacent when you have something um, that you feel that you know, there's not much to be achieved again. Let's say somebody who is a market leader and they just believe that they've gone to the zenith of this industry and what have you. God's complacency is in none but in himself. So, whether it's in terms of his salvation, that's why he could trust our salvation to nobody, not to an angel. He himself had to become the second man and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In terms of creation, he didn't delegate the work of creation to angels. So, God's complacency is in himself, in his wisdom, in his power, in all that he is. So, there is nothing which exists after the manner of his being. Nothing incomparable. Mention anything that is infinite apart from God. Zero. Even the air, we can't clean because um, the other day I was watching on Netflix a documentary on doc series on um, Elon Musk um, space, uh, how NASA, also some other documentaries on NASA, and found out that look in the air, in the space, when they go to the moon, to the space station, they are actually floating there, and of course within the space, the, the space shuttle and what have you. So you even find that air is probably the most circulated in this earth that we know of that is present almost ever apart from God. But air itself is not even everywhere because they couldn't be breathing like we are breathing here on the sun. There's no thing that can exist in the manner of his being. Infinite, invisible, immortal, indestructible, unconquerable. So it's infinity to imprint our minds with uninterruptible awe and veneration. And part of the reason why we we're exhorted to give thanks and praise to God is because our minds is being refreshed and renewed. Daily our minds are being perfected with a whole lot of things, doubts, low self-esteem, so much bad news, which is what the media primes up on. So now to now imprint our heart with an uninterruptible awe of God. Whether it's even looking at the work of creation, whether it's even studying the Bible and looking at scriptures, but just to have a sense of greatness for God is infinitely above all His works. God is infinitely above all His works. His works in the first creation, His work in the new creation. Um, look at the animal kingdom. Look at the plant, uh, the, the the vegetation kingdom. Every one of them, uniqueness, difference in color, shape, size, name, <laughs> and what have you. So it's infinitely above. It's the works that we've seen are not everything that is to be seen of God. There's much more to God than God has, maybe that we are privileged to know. We have seen only but a few of his works. And that's why sometimes watching these scientists or news on going to the Mars and how um, the scientists are exploring into space. And you could imagine that Venus, Jupiter, are they just 
empty of no i mean this i'm not saying whether there's life there but god will not just create anything without a purpose so we are yet to see every part of his work his very name should never be mentioned without a pulse and this is why even the jews revile the name of god especially the name yahweh it's more like a covenant name with god and the i am that i am so the name of god that's why the scripture says that uh, that shall not call the name of the lord in vain and that's why we praise it and we don't just say yeshua just i mean uh, like vain repetition but it's with a gratitude it's with a sense of awe it's a privilege to call your name because when you call a name the spirit of that name will come and that's why i said that uh, that uh, those who call upon the name of the lord the lord shows himself rich towards them in romans 10. there is no end neither a beginning to his greatness there is no end, neither was there a beginning to his greatness. His greatness did not start with creation. His greatness had, is, it's, it, it has no origination. <laughs> it's, as, it's as timeless, it's as, uh, it's as uh, deathless as the being of God himself. So the majesty of him that we see all around is not, people are saying greatness. Uh, a child is born, they just don't become a great engineer from the day they were born. They study into it, they acquire knowledge. God doesn't acquire any knowledge to be great. He's great because he's great, because he himself is greatness indeed. So there is no end, neither a beginning to his greatness. We cannot but be con he cannot but be conscious of every motion that arises in the whole world. God is ever aware of everything going on in his universe. Nothing is hidden in his sight, like he said in uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Nothing is hidden in the sight of him to whom all things are naked before. And so we see that everything is plain. So even noticing the fact that the number of the ears of our head are numbered, ah. <laughs> God is to be feared. God is to be revived. Because what, even what you are thinking, not even just what is visible. God has, uh, wow. Well, that's why Psalm 139, David was saying that, how wonderful are your thoughts that is too great for me. Let me go there. It's privileged to, that is in the secret place of our heart, God is aware. And it's really a comfort to know that you know, even some things, because as humans, there's a tendency whereby we think um, we are just by ourselves. Nobody knows what we are going through, and to now read about how God, um, Psalm 139, verse 11, or let me read from verse 4 For there is not a word in my tongue, but you, O Lord, know it it's together. Thou art beset, thou art beset me behind and before, and laid thy hand upon me. Verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit, or whither shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend up into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost part of the sea, even there shall your hand lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be like the light before you. Hmm. Verse 13, 12. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the night are both alike to you. As he is present to everything, he cannot but be attentive to everything. So God's presence in the universe is not a passive presence. And that's why certain things, we pray for the intervention of God because the more we pray, the more we experience. We say we pray that the kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we take a part, we pray. And part of the encouragement for us when we pray is that we are confident that we are not praying to a God who is sitting in the heaven and it's when we pray, it comes on the earth. Already it's almost like, like a Wi-Fi signal anyway, that the moment is not when you're uh, putting the password or accessing that the, the Wi-Fi is always there. It's just that the password just connects you to it to an, to an inherent power that is already available. So our prayer just makes manifest more of its manifestations here, on, and that's how God has created it. That, oh, I just had things that happen without prayer. You might not be the one that pray for that thing, but I bet you that prayer is the license that this art gives to God to intervene.
him. God wants to intervene in a lot of things. So even when things happen in your life and my life, we didn't even pray for great things, so to say. Let's not think it was just God doing it and be tragic. Someone somewhere is interceding. That's why God has called us as New Testament believers to stand in the gap and to pray for all men. It is impossible for an infinite being to remove himself from any of his creatures. How will a person just be able to avoid air, for example? I mean, air is both the nearest thing we can think of being infinite. I mean, air is infinite, like I said before, that air might not, the oxygen we breathe probably is not in other planets and what have you. And so we now find out that, look, as God is infinite, nothing can be void of Him. Nothing is void of Him. He fills all His works and presence with His creation, with all. And this is very, very important because in our interaction and dealings with our fellow human beings. This is why he said that I was in the hospital, you didn't visit me, I was in prison, you didn't come, I was hungry, you didn't feel I was uh, thirsty. Because the fellow, our fellow humans, we are not worshipping them, but we are taking them uh, as a work of God, God's and the work, and someone who is not void of the presence of so are different areas of the presence of God. There is His glorious presence, there is the indwelling presence, you know, there is the grace. There are different levels, but there is also the essential presence of God, which is the, the presence of God essentially with everything, every creature. That's how the young ravens can call upon Him. That's how the young lions, He could feed them. And that essential presence, every creature has access to it. But of course, for us believers in Christ Jesus, we also have His indwelling presence, not just His essential presence alone. So nothing is void of Him. No contemplation is more satisfying than that which is of God Himself. There is no thought. And that's why I'm grateful for a platform like this. And I'm sure there are different, many other vessels God is using as platforms. Because the most important thing that my mind or the human heart has to be thinking on is God. Any area, though you don't have to be a pastor for that. He said they will keep him in perfect peace whose heart is stayed on him. Huh? Is there any, is there only pastors that need peace? Everybody needs peace. But God says that our hearts, and so that's why a contemplation, thinking, a gleaning on God every day. That's why David said, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 1 also say, Blessed is that man whose delight is in the Lord. He delights to meditate on God. On the word of God. The depth of his love is not to be sounded by human understanding. This is a love that has no beginning. Romans chapter 8, Romans 5 says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. So many an average Christian, so many versions of the Bible and like, which one should I open? Romans 5, it said, For when we were enemies, I think it was 10, 12, that uh, God commended His love towards us and while we were yet sinners. Verse 8, But God commended His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Why did He die for us? For many reasons. A part of the critical reason is that so that He can bring us to God. In Eden, in the garden when man was created, man had no veil between him and God. But the fall of man brought a veil and Christ has now come to bring us back the just time for the unjust to bring us to God. God has not given us the faculties, given us faculties sufficient enough to extol and magnify His unutterable goodness. We can't, and that's why He had to give us the prayer language of praying in the Spirit, of thanking God in the Spirit, because our spirit man is ready to burst out in appreciation to God, to give thanks to God. We are a thanking people. And on this platform, anytime you come across some material by the mercy and the grace of God, every, almost every page is an adoration of God, is an exaltation of God, that our heart is just grateful and thankful to God, either for what He has made us, either for who He is. So He hasn't given our, we, we don't have sufficient faculties. Yes, we have a heart, a mind, and what have you, as huge as it is, but it is never enough to be able to magnify His unutterable goodness. I mean, a goodness that what we are today in the new creation is not something that we orchestrated. We couldn't have orchestrated our salvation. That God will become flesh to save a rebel like man. <laughs> oh, wow. 
even the angels extol and say, what is man that you are mindful of him? We can have no idea of eternality, which is like a dateless time, eternity, whereby there is no beginning and there is no end. Because we live and we dwell in a, in a zone, in a realm, where we have what is past, present and future. So today is Wednesday, November, October 25th. Yesterday was October 24th, tomorrow is October 26th. And so we live in that succession of days and time. But that doesn't exist with God. It remains the same, eternal, unchangeable. So it's so that those are part of the things, especially we talked more about this in the eternality of God, whereby God is able to make all grace. God is able to, excuse me, God is able to Dwell. God dwells in every realm, in every age, in every dispensation, in every generation. And so that's why it remains the same. Nothing with reference to his existence is either past or to come. Nothing about God is something. There was nothing he had yesterday, yesterday, yes, dateless past, that he doesn't still have today. It's still the same. Nothing is changing in him, essentially. Nothing is changing. There's no character change. There is no... Uh, attributes, fluctuations here and there. So that's why whatever God is, God is infinitely so. So he can't become better of anything that he is. It remains the same. So nothing with reference to his existence is either past or to come. Nothing is futuristic about him. However, his works, for example, the judgment that is to come, things that are not, when we say nothing, we're saying that nothing essentially in himself. But of course, there are other things that he has a mark, for example, our salvation in the Old Testament was until the Lord Jesus Christ came. For him as a person, he doesn't become wiser tomorrow. He wasn't more loving yesterday. He still remains the same. So there are greater things undiscovered about him. Do you know them? No, I don't. But I know that this is not all there is to know of God. <laughs> even the best of the theology and even the best of the, uh, the most knowledgeable in the person of God, great vessels and what have you, what they know is only a minute, it's like a drop in an ocean. There are still more undiscovered things about him. What he discloses to us, especially from his word, I think are things, revelations that are sufficient enough for our work with him. It doesn't mean that, that the Bible is everything that is of God. No, God is infinitely more than that. And so that we adore him. That's why we say we can exalt him as he is. Nothing refreshes the mind like the thoughts of him. Nothing. I think it was A.W. Tozer. He probably was quoting one of the church fathers in his book, uh, The Knowledge of the Holy One, that the greatest thoughts that a human mind can entertain is a thought on God. That's the most, and because it's, it, it, the meditation on God is healing in itself. Meditation on God is bringing, downloading God into our spirit, man. <laughs> because you are what you think. He said, as a man he is in his house, so he is. And so nothing refreshes and feeds our mind other than the thoughts on the person of God, on His goodness, on His love, on His power, on His mind. That's why the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit is, has helped us to understand what is in the Scripture so that our mind will always be filled. Say, don't, say, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. It contains within Himself all things. So whoever contains all things, definitely we can exalt Him as He is. We can magnify Him as He is. That every part of creation is, we are all living, moving, and having our being in Him. That's why everything is naked before Him. Rational and irrational abide in Him. <laughs> you read Job 37, 38, 39, and you just see how God is almost looking at creation and saying, Do you know the foundation? Do you know the pillars that hold the earth? Do you know why the horse is excited at the sound of battle? So, even the rational and the irrational, every creature, there's not one. That can, that can be exempted from His sight, from His presence, or from living in Him, because we are all dwelling in a space, that space is dwelling in Him. His wisdom is unsurmountable by any created understanding. The manifold wisdom of God, the wisdom of God in creation, is manifold wisdom in salvation of our souls. And that's why God enjoys us to pray for the spirit of wisdom. He said that wisdom is, uh, 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 that, that, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, that the, that wisdom is better than silver and gold. I think Proverbs 4, Proverbs 8 as well, so that we go after it. And wisdom is a person. It's just the person of God himself in Christ. So that is, we could almost call wisdom as what God will do in any situation. Steps God will take to be able to do anything 
how God will go out like strategies God will use. And the, God's strategy is just God himself. He can do one thing in 10,000 different ways in 10,000 different ways. I heard this from Apostle Aaron, that we don't bind God. And um, yesterday I was listening to Dr. Sam and uh, talking about how we should uncover or, uh, yeah, uncover the, the latent destiny or potential or gift or talent that we have. Uh, this, uh, paraphrasing what we're saying. But essentially, it's to, the, the point to drive home is that every one of us were a person of value. God has made us, God never created a waste. God never created anything that is worthless. We all have something to give to the world. And sometimes we look at what others are doing or what others have and we feel we don't have. Five loops cannot be enough. But God can use our five loops because He can do one thing in 10,000 different ways. In them. That's why He could heal the sick, He could spit on the floor, He could tell them to go to the river. So, whatever five loops or the jar of oil that you have in your hand, present it to God. Don't look down on it. If it's something God has given you that will bless humanity, this is something that He might be cooking, He might be putting here, He might be creating, might, whatever it is, it might be even invisible services, I mean services that have been rendered, but we take it to God so that God's breath will be upon it and God will now, because God cannot be bound. Everything we are doing now is not the best way to be done. But there was a time it was only on monkeys, sorry, on donkeys, people were going from point A to point B. Now we have cars, we have airplanes. That's not going to be the end. We come naked to Him and commit unhastily to His unquestionable, infallible providence. And that's why we can rely on what He tells. We, we seek counsel from Him because uh, we, do, we can't see beyond our nose as humans, naturally, except God and giving, brightens our vision, except God gives us insight. So that's why we submit to His providence. Often pray to him, as someone said, and think that, uh, yeah, it was Apostle Aaron, and one of us was saying that there's the answers to prayer and there's the reward of prayer. The answers we are seeking for in prayer might not be the greatest good that can come to our way, but God also gives us rewards for even coming to him, which is a joy to seek the Lord, which is a joy to pray to him that you are not just giving me what I'm praying for, but you also give me reward. That is, this. God is saying that I can do beyond what you have prayed for. He is more present with everything than anything is to itself. God is more present to me than the quotes I'm wearing. And that's my desire to be more conscious of His presence. So that in anything I'm doing, anyone that is conscious of His presence is really afraid. He said that, you are, uh, that though I walk with the valley of shadow, that I fear no evil for you are with me. It's the presence of God that takes fear away. It's not really as if it's the absence of the situations that could have caused him one to be, uh, to be frightened, but the very, very presence of God. Because God cannot be threatened by anything. <laughs> nothing is new to him. Nothing comes as a surprise. So he's more present with everything. And even with this, it even makes us to honor one another. Honor in terms of being, uh, being uh, not doing things that are malicious or thinking maliciously towards one another. Because we just see that, look, even if what they are doing is, uh, appears to be like um, a contrary thing, we, come, we, we walk in love and we allow the righteous judge himself to judge in the situation. So he's more present with everything than anything is to itself. He's closer to us than even our skin is to our bones. All things live in him eternally. All things, all things. Nothing is existing outside of God. There is no existing that is outside of God. Because before anything was created, <laughs> everything was created into space, right? Even the angels, I believe, were created into space. But where was space before God created anything? Where was God before God created anything? Nothing existed before God, and nothing will exist after Him. And so, uh, He is His own existence. So, all things live in Him. That's why uh, Acts 17 says that in Him we live, we move, and have our being. All things live in Him eternally. Even hell, that's what David in Psalm 139 said, even if I go to hell, you still be there. His intimate is infinitely satisfying to Himself and every rational being. And this is why our praises to Him is always unending. We keep the gate of our praise open, as Pastor Kodiyo Emadi will say, 
the heart of our thanksgiving to God. We keep that gate continually open. Praise from I think Isaiah 61 or so that our thanksgiving is unto Him who is infinite and there is no end to it. And I believe the more we study the Word of God, the more we come across material. So God will be, if the heart is willing, God will bring our ways, materials, things that we augment our praise life so that we are not just singing the lyrics of songs but God is also giving us revelations from his word and we start singing that revelations in adoration to him. His tribe personality is utterly inconceivable by any mortal. Inconceivable. God as the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, I don't think anyone can ever get a full grasp as to how God is one but trying. <laughs> how God is one but trying. First John 5, 7 said there are three that bear witness in heaven. The, uh, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So this is beyond uh, human ability. And that's one of the reasons why we bow in adoration to say, you are God from beginning to the end. There is none like you. It is inconceivable how God is one and trying. <laughs> how the Father will speak and he will say, this is my son. And yet God is talking to God. How Hebrews 1, 8, we say, God saying to his son, saying, your throne, oh God, God calling God, God, is a mystery that is beyond us, utterly inconceivable by any mortal. What a joy. All things are full of God. All things are full of God. They are the work of God, but they are not to be idolized. It's not pantheism. It's not to worship any created thing. But God essentially is present with all things. He is whatsoever he is without bounds or limits. God is all that He is without bound, without limits. God is uh, an ocean without shore, if you want to call it that way. God in Himself is inexhaustible in wisdom, in power, in love, in patience, in long suffering. And that's why God wants us to come continually to a continuous growth in the knowledge of Him. That our knowledge of Him is on the increase on every day. So we can't define his presence by a certain place. We can't say, oh, um, Jacob could do it. And we can't define it by a certain experience. That's how the men of all the patriarchs built altars. Whatever they encounter, like Bethel, like they, uh, Jacob, that's okay, they encountered God in here, in this location. But in our day and age, we would almost say that our various encounters are like altars we now set up. Maybe somebody got, um, uh, they had a health situation and they got healed, or they were delivered from something. The, the men of old will build an altar around that and they now say, mm, this is Jehovah Rapha, this is Jehovah Sabbath. And so, but when it comes to space, we can't say this is where God is alone, to say in the church alone. So church is the only limit. So as to say, here is it, but it's not there. God is in the shrine of the Hudu. God is in the mosque, but it is not his gracious presence that is there. Anywhere that is not being honored, it's another presence, like in Psalm 139, what David was saying. It is not God's gracious presence that is in hell. It is wrought. <laughs> oh, no limit can be ascribed to him so as to say, thus far is being riches and no further. He can't say he's in earth and he can't go beyond or into the ocean. He can't go to Jupiter. No such limit can be ascribed to God. Let me read. Um, psalm let me go back to psalm and take some psalms of praise psalms of thanksgiving i will extort you oh lord my god oh, let me take is it one six psalm 92. oh let that oh it is it is a good thing psalm 92 it is a good thing to give thanks to the lord and to sing praises unto your name O most High, to show forth your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night upon an instrument of ten strings upon the Splastery and the harp with a solemn sound. For you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands. O oh, Lord, how great are your works, and your thoughts are very deep. He is everywhere present in an inconceivable manner. Inconceivable manner. Ha! Ah, hallelujah. That's why we take joy in interceding and praying, because there's no place we are, is not. Even what a joy that it is not just what we say that God is uh, limited to hearing. That even our heart, and that's why meditating on God is a sweet thing. Because our heart is just communing with the immortal one. So even in the deepest darkness 
and closest recesses of privacy in our hearts. God is here, hearing every part. But thou, Lord, art most high forever, Psalm 92. For lo, your enemies, O Lord, for lo, your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn you shall exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. My eye also shall see my desire on my enemies, and my ears shall hear my desire on the wicked that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. It shall grow like the cedar of Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the court of our God. We shall bring forth fruit in our old age, and we shall be fat that is productive and flourishing, to show that the Lord is upright, is our rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. The treasure of his goodness cannot be evangelized. And I think it's Psalm 34 uh, or 33 that mentioned that the earth is full of his goodness. That is, anywhere, it's like everywhere is pregnant with the goodness of God. Every relationship is preg pregnant with the goodness of God. And this is why we need to honor all men. We need to appreciate one another. Whether it's a boss at work that maybe is not dealing with you with kindness, but that relationship is pregnant with something. Because the goodness of God is everywhere. That's why maybe God enjoys us to walk in love. He said, if you are only forgiving or uh, having good disposition towards those who are your friends, then what's the difference? I think Matthew mentioned that, that we, 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 we pray for those that despitefully use us. Because goodness can come out of it. This is God that can bring. They will know, not that they do it intentionally, but God will just cause them to say something or do something that will turn out to be for our good. And this is why we need special grace to walk in love every day. To walk in love towards those around us, those who are distant to us, that we, we don't allow bitterness to come forth from our hearts because the goodness of God fills the whole heavens and the earth. He is the prime mover of every positive action or positive move. And so this is why, when that's why scriptures and judges like, give thanks to the Lord because there's a part, a man or a woman, we could get certain good things, say no man can, uh, no good thing can anyone receive it. Um, as John was saying this, that a man can receive nothing except it be given from above. Every good and every perfect gift comes from above. Men are both vessels. Human are both vessels. So we don't forget the source. To return to say, thank you for this. Yes, you got a raise, a business proposal, um, works of your hand across one thing. We are saying thank you to him that because without him, he couldn't have money. First thing. So he's a prime mover of every positive action. His kind-heartedness provides for everything right down to the last detail. Right down. And that's why we rejoice in him, that God's provincial care. So many things, it's not everything we prayed for that we got in life. I mean, you can't say someone got scholarship, someone got this. Not, it's not all those things that we prayed for like consciously. Some things just happen like, wow, I wasn't even asking for this. God, I'm grateful. That's just to show the kind-heartedness of our God. Psalm 93 says, The Lord reigns, he is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he had gilded himself. The Lord also is established that it cannot be moved. That tr the, word is, the word also is established that it cannot be moved. Your throne is established of old, and thou art from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yes, than the mighty waves of the sea. That testimonies are very sure, holiness becomes your house, O Lord, forever. So nothing from the greatest to the smallest things can escape is eternal providence. Nothing, nothing. The ravens say, oh, it's okay, why do some things, or uh, maybe the establishment, there's family, many of these might be human cost. Sometimes God might bring solution or give um, a way out, but sometimes, Humans, let me even let me leave the animals because humans for the animals, I mean, they don't have when they are giving baths, God takes care of all those things. They don't have hospital, they are going so to say to go and deliver massage. But for human, because of the corrupted nature, a man has a will of his own, he has a will to reject the help of God, just like many reject uh, by God's grace. God will turn their heart from rejecting the salvation of Christ. There's nothing he has made that is so distant, so little, or so inconsiderate to him. Nothing nothing that's why we say we, we don't despise anything 
because the if is the work of God and not it created itself, even the ants. So I'm not saying that you see ants in your house, <laughs> because there's a place God has built for ants. I don't see ants outside, I'm going to kill them. But I'm, I'm not condemning them, I'm just trying to get anyone any gifts for me. But there's, if you find some things that are low, or roaches around or something in the house, and this is not your place, <laughs> please <laughs> exit or we, we stop that cycle. But you understand what I mean? But nothing is so distant or so little or so inconsiderate to him. So there's no such thing as um, to God, this is unimportant or this is an unimportant creature. This is uh, if God gives, I believe, equal attention to every detail because I don't think it's he said, Thou has created all things for that pleasure. So if it is for his pleasure, then we can't despise it. So despite his transcendency, he's ever mindful of us. Despite his loftiness, his exalted state, that's why the angels were asking God, What is man that you are mindful of me? What is man? And what is man? Not even who is man. What is man? What's the composition of our man is a tarmac, man is an altar for God to dwell in. And that's why man is very essential. He can communicate with the spirit world and the physical world at random. He can, because he's a spirit essentially, and at the same time, he can operate in the physical world. And that's why spirit beings need man, <laughs> because they need a mortal person, because God gave the license or the authority of the earth to man. For we are unable not only to do, I love this, but even to think what is right, what the Philippian tree talks about, whatever Philippian for rather, whatever is good, whatever is noble, think on such things. And it's a battle to get the heart, the mind to think on what is positive because it appears almost all around us, the air is filled with negativity, profanity, and what have it. It's like a discipline to say, no, my eyes will not think on that, my eyes will not meditate on that. We set a guard. So we can't even claim. For by our own strength that we are doing it, but it is as from the Lord. As the Lord helps us, gives us the grace, gives us that His Spirit is upon us, His Spirit in us. I was into that the about Papa Edico this morning about how the Spirit of servants would, in terms of look many things that as he has experienced and gone through in life, whether in the place of prayer, fasting, and not uh, not falling into the temptation to be bitter against those who are unjustly. I mean, uh, lying against him and what have you, that it is the Spirit of God that has been his help, that without that Spirit filling us afresh, we will respond in the flesh. <laughs> because, I mean, we are products of the fall of man. So it takes the Spirit of God in us that quickens us, that drives us to the supernatural, that drives us to live a life that is well-pleasing to God. So we exist in space, space exists in Him. So we know our place. So we don't think so when God was asking Adam, Adam, where are you? It wasn't a question of physical location because the space is actually existing in God. It was more of his consciousness. What are you conscious of? What have you done? Huh? Where are you? Where is your heart? What's the posture of your heart? <laughs> have you seen what? So space exists. We also exist in time and time exists in God. And so that when we are saying that, who can exalt him as he is? It's like looking and saying, wow, you are great beyond description. Your wisdom, your infinity is out of this world. We exist in time. Time exists in God. Time is just a bridge between eternity past and eternity future. So there is nothing said, no, not to God that all is worked from the beginning of time. So we exist in time. Time is existing in God. So that's why the scripture says that a thousand years is but a day before this, like a day before the one, a day is like a thousand years. Because God is not existing in time. Time, eternity, every one of them is existing in God. Who can exalt him as so none but the maker of heaven and earth merits the profoundest veneration of all. That is our all, our gratitude, our thanksgiving. Every creature under heaven, Psalm 50, 150, say, say, give thanks, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Psalm 150, praise ye the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in the firmament of his power, praise him for his mighty acts, praise him according to his excellent greatness. His boundless fullness overflow to all who depend on him. The boundless fullness of God, praise him. 
for his mighty acts and 150. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the plastry and the harp. Praise him with the tambourine and dance. Praise him with the string instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbal. Let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. His creation and every part of it is full of him. Psalm 149. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of sin. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. <laughs> Let them sing praise unto him with the tambourine and the harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hands. To execute vengeance upon the hidden and punishment upon the people. We are of little knowledge. God is omniscient. God is all-knowing. So any situation that we are in, it's an opportunity for God to show himself as the all-knowing God in our affairs. So we acknowledge our littleness before God. We acknowledge him as the all-knowing God. There is no knowledge that God is going to acquire from everywhere. For no known to him are all his work from the beginning of age. So Psalm 149 as well, verse 8, To bind the kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written, the honor on, uh, of all is in praise ye the Lord. We of little power is almighty. But the joy of it is that God has put his Holy Spirit in us as an inherent power, dunamis, so that we can prosecute and fulfill our destiny in life. Without power, many things will remain unattainable or undone. It's wonderful to have our certification, to educate our soul, to have all the, in our field, to sharpen our skill, but that, the horse has to be prepared for battle, but victory belongs to the Lord. So through exercising our spirit, man, through the Holy Spirit, as many of us that are saved, as we pray in the Spirit, what we are now doing is that just that, that latent or inherent or potential power in us of God now becomes a power that is manifested, a power that now comes to a kinetic energy, a power that can heal the sick, a power that can minister life and grace to the world. He entitles himself as I am that I am to distinguish himself as the only being who truly and really exists, which is his name, Yahweh, that is the name he gave to Moses in Exodus, um, in, in, in the book of Exodus. Psalm 148, Praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the height. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his souls. Praise ye him, sun, moon. Praise him, all you stars of light. Praise him, you heavens of heaven, and you waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. He had also established them forever. He has made a decree which shall not pass. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons, on all deeps, fire and hail, snow and vapor, stormy and wind, fulfilling His word, mountains and all the hills, fruit, fruit trees and all the sediments, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth and all the people, princes and all judges of the head, both young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the heaven and the earth. He also exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his sin, even of the children of Israel, a people near to him, praise ye the Lord. His greatness encompasses our littleness as the heavens the earth. And so the last page again is who can magnify him as a he. So today we'll be able to look at the topic how can, how can, who can exalt him as a he is? How can he be exalted in the fullness of his being? And so the joy of the Christian is that we're worshiping a God that is infinitely above all his works. We have only seen but few of his work. God is great beyond description. His light is light above light. His glory is glory within glory. His infinity is such that everything is not, nothing is hidden from him. Nothing can be absent from him. God does not forget. God cannot lie. God cannot be deceived because of his all knowingness. And so this greatness of God is much to be adored. That every day the heart, the mind is always longing to contemplate on him. Nothing refreshes our heart and our mind 
like meditating on the person of God. What a joy that we have access to this great monarch who is our Father, our Lord and our Redeemer. What a joy to the greatness of his work. Hallelujah to God the Father. Hallelujah to God the Son. Hallelujah to God the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.